John. Hello again, everybody. Uh, Senator, Congressman, welcome. I have to say I've been really looking forward to this session because you two are both out of politics, which means you can tell us what you actually think. <laughs> well, we, did that ever stop us before? We always I don't did know. that. <laughs> you were just telling me that the last time you all were up on stage, you got into a fist fight. So we can only hope for a repeat this morning. We shall we see. We were joking, of course. Yeah, yeah no, we'll see. More of a spat. We'll see. Yeah. Um, Senator Lieberman, let me start with you. You may not recall this, but you and I both had occasion to meet in 2004. I showed up at your office on Capitol Hill, it's a pretty spring day, and I'd showed up because I was working on a story about T-TIC. Anybody remember T-TIC? Yep. A room of blank faces. Yeah. This, was, this was one of the marquee post 9-11 reforms, the Terrorist Threat Integration Center. Yeah, the T-TIC was the predecessor to NCTC. It was indeed. It had been up me. and running about a year. <laughs> right. Um, a guy named John Brennan was running it. Yeah, whatever happened to him? What happened yeah. to him? Long time ago. Yeah. So long okay. ago you were a Democrat back then. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, I... <laughs> um, you told me uh, on that pretty April day that you feared TTIC and a lot of these other reforms were, and I'm quoting you, potentially calamitous. And your concern, as I diligently reported on NPR the next morning, was that you feared we were creating all these huge bureaucracies that would work at cross purposes and still not really talk to each other. So my question to you is, have we created all these huge bureaucracies that work at cross purposes and still don't really talk to each other? Yeah, so uh, I actually uh, remember that conversation and I, I believe that, uh, though <laughs> to continue with theme that will probably uh, be reflected on all panels, uh, nothing's perfect. But we actually have made great progress in that regard. I mean, I think what the, the last panel used the word disaster. We, we experienced the national disaster on 9-11, 15 years ago. And uh, one thing it did is to wake us up, notwithstanding uh, the truck bombing at the World Trade Center in 93, the, uh, the bombings at the embassies, uh, the USS Cole, et cetera, that, that we were in a new kind of war. So that, that was the first thing. Second. Um, we did act, and incidentally, we acted on a very uh, bipartisan, nonpartisan basis, created the Department of Homeland Security. The whole purpose was to bring people together. And, and incidentally, the big battles in that legislative experience were not between Republicans and Democrats. They were between people close, basically arguing for a given agency that didn't want to be blended under the department or in the intelligence reform that followed 9-11, um, the 9-11 so commission report. we've made great progress, what, right. what would you point to? What's worked? Well, I, I point to the, look, together, the Department of Homeland Security creation and uh, the reform of the intelligence uh, system uh, in response to the 9-11 commission constitute the biggest changes in our national security apparatus since the late 40s, which was the beginning of the Cold War. So we were beginning a new uh, era of conflict and I just say um, every day at the NCTC, through the Director of National Intelligence, the Department of Homeland Security, the various agencies of the federal government are sharing information, are working together. I, I mean, these, these are big bureaucracies and a lot of people are involved. So is it occasionally inefficient or top heavy? Yeah, but, but boy, they're recognizing the enemy and talking a lot more. Uh, than they did before, and I guess the bottom line uh, that I would say, I believe this uh, from my own review, but also from the 9-11 Commission, if the uh, reforms that exist today existed on 9-11, uh, the 9-11 attack could not have been successfully launched against our country. Congressman, let me let you jump in here. What have we gotten right since 9-11? Well, I think we're, we are much better integrated. And one of the things that we did, and it was really a leadership-driven event as much as it was an organizational event. I think those organizational events were important because it started driving integration in a way we couldn't do when they were separate. Uh, do I think there's lots of room for uh, reform? Yet, I do. But one of the things that we got right, we started dispatching NSA analysts downrange. Never really did that before. So you had what do you NSA. Mean by that? Uh, so the NSA is was a is a big signals collection intelligence agency. And it was separated from the combat environment in a way that probably wasn't helpful 
prior to 9-11. So you had troops in combat in Iraq, Afghanistan, other places in the world. They started to do this, and this wasn't done by legislation, this was done because they, of this integration effort, they had the opportunity to do this. They dispatch analysts downrange, and it sounds like a small thing, but it was the first you mean time- getting them out of Fort Meade. Get them out of Fort Meade, them putting them in Afghanistan, putting them in uh, other countries around the world, putting them in places like Iraq, in ways that they hadn't done that before. So you had all of our intelligence services sitting in the same room looking at the same problem set, and every one of them could pick up the phone when you ran into a problem, call the mothership, and say, we have this problem, can we work this out? How do we get the right resources? How do we get the right answer? How do we apply the resources that we have to solving a particular intelligence problem? I think that was a, we really saw huge benefits from this almost immediately. And so we've, we've seen those kinds of things. That part we've gotten right. I think the PDB, by the way, uh, and President's I was- Daily Brief. P President's Daily Brief is a much better product today because of the DNI structure. Mm, why? And I was a reluctant DNI supporter of uh, the organization, to be fair, uh, because you have a more coordinated effort. Nobody gets to say, my information is a little more important than the other agency information, right? And we, we're all human nature. We all think our agencies are the best. We all know that the FBI is the best intelligence organization. <laughs> we all know that going into this. Uh, and everybody has that belief. And what the PDB now represents is an accurate picture from all of the agencies. Sometimes an agency isn't going to be represented. Even, you know, say the CIA might not be represented in the PDB today because the information that's collected cross, uh, you know, cross pollinated, now you can get the best product on the president's desk for the best solution. And I think that is a positive result from the DNI creation. Do you get to read the PDB, by the way, as chair of the House? No, not in the form of no. it's in the PDB. All the information that's available in the PD, you know, times 10, the president sees it for a little bit. As chairman, you can get all of that plus some, but you don't see it in the form of the PDB. <coughs> but we got our own daily briefs. You're talking about all of the different agencies together putting information in that you think it's a more balanced product, no one agency gets to outweigh the other. On the other hand, sometimes one stream of intelligence reporting is, is more accurate than the others. And as we know from the Iraq war fiasco, uh, there's the danger of not connecting the dots. There's also the danger of groupthink, and you, you get a diluted product if you just pour everything all in together and say everybody gets a voice. Well, but they don't say. That's the, that's, I guess maybe I missed that part. They don't get a voice. Some days, as I said, the CIA might not get in. The next day, it might be all CIA product because of that is the best, most timely information given what the situation of the day is for the purpose of a national security decision. So I, that's why I think it's a better product. You might get a little CIA, a little NSA, a little NGA, a little DIA in there. All you, any other acronyms you Keep can- Keep going. Yeah, yeah exactly. I'm a, I might through, yeah. be able to get them all, maybe. <laughs> uh, and so that's the benefit of it. And it could be a one, per, you could have one analyst, uh, you know, three quarters of that thing be through one group analytical product that makes it to the PDB because of it's that important, it's that good, it's that fresh, and it's that accurate on that particular day. In the old days, that, I'm not sure that was the case. So when we looked, kind of did a historical look at it, you know, the agency that ran it was the CIA. They're gonna wait, I think, realistically to the CIA product. Uh, you get great CIA product, now you get great other products as well. And I, that to me was one of the big benefits of the Director of National Intelligence. Senator Lieberman, uh, staying with this theme of things that have been fixed, reformed yeah. since 9-11, DHS. Department right. of Homeland Security, it was your baby. I mean, you. I remember you fighting for that long time, a lot of battles on the Hill. Hand over heart, do you think it's been a useful? Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not gonna deny paternity here. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm, uh, you know, this uh, baby occasionally acts in ways that as all of our children do, that you're not so sure of, about, but I, I know Incidentally, it was, uh, I was actively involved, I was glad to be, but it was really bipartisan. Fred Thompson, uh, the late great Fred, dear friend, was uh, working with me on the Homeland Security Committee. There were people in the House on, on both sides. But the, the bottom line was we took, you know, then 22 significant agencies, brought them together, and- And you this, wanted more. I mean, you wanted the FBI to be in there, for example, right. yeah. Right. Uh, incidentally, this all started, I, I don't take full credit for this because it was actually a report earlier in 2001, before 9-11, by a commission <clears throat> chaired by uh, Warren Rudman and Gary Hart uh -huh. that foresaw a uh, terrorist group taking advantage of the, of the disorganization of the American security agencies 
and uh, striking us and recommended something like the Department of Homeland Security. You know, this is going to be, um, uh, it's a funny reference point, but I um, want <clears throat> somebody to send me a speech that Fred Smith <coughs> of FedEx gave to his employees. And he said, uh, the journey to better service by FedEx has no final destination point. In other words, we, we're going to have to continue always to get better and better. And, um, you know, there's still more of that to do. But are we safer as a result of having a DHS with all the component parts working together? Uh, we sure are. I guess, I mean, it prompts the question about how you get the balance right. Are right. we safer? Okay. You, I mean, you could certainly point to the fact that there hasn't been anything on the scale of 9-11 since 9-11. Right. And, that, and that's a significant that's fact to point to. Significant. On the other hand, I know the number that's being put on what has been spent to prevent that from right. happening is somewhere in the neighborhood of a trillion dollars. Nobody would advocate, you know, any action that might bring about another huge catastrophic mass casualty attack. On the other hand, that's a trillion dollars that hasn't been spent on schools and roads yeah. and hospitals and other things. Do you think we've gotten the balance right? Let me let you take it first, and then I want to hear you on this too, Congressman. Well, I, I don't know the number. I can't judge whether it's accurate. I'll assume for the moment it's accurate. Um, you know, the first responsibility of the federal government, we all say this, it's true, is to pr uh, provide for the common defense, protect the security of our country. Without security, uh, you don't have freedom. You don't have the opportunity to really get kids um, well-educated. So uh, can I say that if it is a trillion dollars, that every dollar was sent, spent officially? Of course not. But um, um, we were under attack on 9-11, and uh, we've stopped similar attacks, but we're obviously still under attack by this uh, spreading menace of, um, of radical Islamist terrorism. Um, which has expressed itself um, since 9-11, mostly in lone wolves who have been uh, radicalized uh, over the internet. And that's something that the Counter Extremism Project, which I'm here on behalf of, which I helped found two year, a couple of years ago, has, has worked on to, to, because here again, the terrorists, as they did on 9-11, using our aviation system, uh, they're using a, a wonderful development in our world, which is the internet. But they're using it to communicate, to radicalize, and uh, sometimes to uh, attack. And uh, for instance, the Counter Extremism Project is focused on putting pressure on Twitter, which is used a lot by radical uh, extremist groups uh, to, to, to deny them uh, uh, that, um, that access. We've developed with a, with a wonderful man named Dr. Hani Farid, who's a, a scientist at Dartmouth College, a, program, uh, which he first developed to kind of automatically find child pornography on the internet, now to uh, do the same for images and, and uh, words that are associated with uh, extremism and terrorism. So uh, the, government, the bottom line here is government's not going to do it all, uh, and um, uh, we're under continuing threat because of how few people can do enormous damage to us on this unconventional battlefield. But um, we're, we're pushing them back. I was struck by a point uh, in the Atlantic Magazine article, our Rainy Safer, that I see a lot of you have got, um, making, asking the question about TSA, for example, talking mm -hmm. about you know, a place where a lot of money has been spent and a lot of effort has been made to get it right. And the question was, how many hijackers have armed air marshals taken down since 9-11? And the answer is not. And yet we have invested and spent and trained thousands and thousands, and they're flying around the country as we speak. How do you weigh that, Congressman? As, you know, as somebody who's controlled the purse strings on this, yeah, how do you get the balance right? So let me tell you a quick story on this. So I, I, as somebody who believes that this is an important thing, and by the way, the intelligence community is what's going to help us prevent and make prevent problems from happening and prevent b bad policy decisions from being engaged on. Right. So I argue it has an outsourced or outsized, excuse me. Uh, impact on what our national security is going to look like in the few, next few years. We don't get that piece right, I guarantee you the other piece isn't going to work right at all. I went out and, and I went to almost, I, when I became chairman, I decided I was going to every bad place in the world to talk to the people on the ground, doing the front, on the front edge of this thing, doing that work. Mm. And one of the conclusions I came away with all of that time spent on the road and with these really great Americans doing some really incredible things was that 
they had some problems. And one of those problems were, and think about, and this is going to shock everyone in this room. Are you all ready? There is politics happening in Washington, D.C. <laughs> And what happened was, because the politics of, was driving the spending, that if it was a counterterrorism case, they got all the money they needed. People were wheelbarrowing it in and dumping it in the office. But if they had a case, uh, an intelligence matter, that was, didn't quite fit the CT, but fit our national security, they were, couldn't find a dollar to work on it. So, and I heard this in multiple places around the country, and I see one good old friend that I had those conversations with, uh, I won't say where you are. See you, good, to, good to see you, Tom, uh, who's now retired, so I can say Tom and not go to jail. I look really bad in those orange jumpsuits with the numbers on the back. Makes me look very boxy, just so you know. <laughs> One of the things we found was we weren't applying the, re we had lots of great money, but could you save money? I came back after about a three-month tour, came back and called the, the directors and said, I'm cutting your budget next year. You might want to come up and see me. Dead silent on the phone. I'm like, what are you talking about? You're the guy. What are you doing? And what we did is we came up and said, how do we spend what we have better? We're going to run into these budget problems. After 9-11, we threw a lot of money at this problem. And I argue, rightly so. I'm with the senator on this 100%. What, you didn't really have a lot of options. And I thought that was the best spent, spending money when, when the goal, the first goal for us is defend America. We were able to take out that first couple of years, about $3 billion, and we did it through merging train, nothing sexy. We didn't take away from mission. The mission had the money. We gave a little more flexibility to the counterterrorism fund so that they could use it on other national security issues, because in some cases they had to give money back, right? Because they couldn't spend it on CT, then they wouldn't allow them to spend it on Nuclear proliferation, I don't know about you, it keeps me up at night. So what we did was we were able to change that. And I think what we're looking at now is have to go through that same review. And we should do it with every agency. And it's, you're going to have some hard conversations. But we were able to cut that much money and not impact mission. Matter of fact, many argued we had more mission dollars available at the end of the day and we spent less money. I believe it's completely possible. It's hard, it's tedious, everybody has their own budget lines. They argued in one budget line about how much fuel they spent on helicopters. I wish I were kidding you, uh, on an intelligence operation. On the other line, uh, you know, they were buying boats because they had so much money they didn't know what to do with it, right? And they might need a boat in this particular region of the Mideast. I want to I open it up in just a second. Think so about that Start for a getting minute. your hands right. ready. Yeah. We're going to have time for a quick question or two. But let me just press you on this. It, it, it seems as though some of the most effective things that have been done since 9-11 have been A, local, and be pretty cheap. I'm thinking of the example in Boston that, that Boston carried out about six months before the marathon bombing, not knowing that that was on the horizon, carried out a big um, emergency preparedness drill and figured out if we were to have a mass casualty attack, where would we take people? What would the exit routes be? Where should we position the, the emergency medical personnel? And they think that that saved a lot of lives, that the hundreds that were injured and rushed to hospitals got treatment that was life-saving. Is that the model going forward now that we've done all the big bureaucratic restructuring in Washington? Well, it's not the exclusive model, but uh, th this is part of uh, uh, one of the big advances that came about because of the Department of Homeland Security that it's not much talked about. Uh, the, the Department of Homeland Security by direction of Congress uh, c created a section that interfaces uh, directly with uh, local and state law enforcement. And you know, there's, that, that gives, uh, I forgot the number, I used to know it, hundreds of thousands of personnel that join the effort to stop uh, a terrorist attack. And I bet that drill in uh, Boston, I don't know, was either encouraged or financed by the Department of uh, Homeland Security because we did that and we've done that in major cities uh, throughout the Still country. Still your baby. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, 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 a, pr I'm a, a proud and I would, I guess I'd say protective father uh, to that uh, <laughs> department. But, but I think you would agree. We, at some point we have to say we're, we're, we've got this huge amount of money being poured into yeah. this funnel at the top. Maybe right. it's not coming out exactly the way we want at the bottom. Can we restructure this in a way that fits that model? Oh, and I if totally we don't do agree. that, I think it would be irresponsible to not go through and try to reevaluate uh, the spending. And the whole of government approach, that's the one thing we haven't gotten right. Mm -hmm. The whole of government approach hasn't quite, got, uh, hasn't quite got to where we need to go. You know, the NSA and the Cyber Command is likely to split. I think that's probably a good decision here for a whole host of reasons. That means that we're going to have some changes and we're going to change these horses midstream. And also on the State Department working with the military, working with our intelligence services, I'm, I'm not convinced we exactly have that right yet. 
And I think that that, will, that change has to happen pretty soon going forward. And the next president is going to inherit, I think, uh, dysfunctional is too strong a word, but certainly a layered bureaucratic National Security Council operation decision-making process that I don't think works for the better of our national security. They're going to have to go in and change that. Not either one of them will probably tackle that issue. It's a big one. A bureaucracy in progress. It's yes. a frightening image. Um, we are tight on time, but I want to squeeze in one question. We've got a quick one from the back. Tell us who you are. Thanks very much. Uh, Rachel Levinson Waldman with the Brennan Center for Justice. Um, I'm interested in terms of the conversation about DHS and whether sort of that money was well spent. Um, of course, DHS sent millions and millions of dollars to fusion centers with very little oversight. Um, and it seems that that money did very little, especially when you're talking about counterterrorism. And I'm interested if um, you think that money was, was well spent in terms of looking back on DHS, thinking yes, ultimately DHS did contribute to national security, whether you would extend that to fusion centers and if you would have suggested something different or do something different in the future. With the benefit of hindsight, good idea, bad idea? Uh, it was a good idea, but it, uh, I mean, in the sense that it literally brought together uh, federal, state, local uh, law enforcement uh, and related <clears throat> agencies. And it, it, I can tell you from the state level, it mattered a lot in local level to those uh, groups to be uh, involved. And they, in turn, helped the federal uh, prevention and law enforcement effort. But, uh, you know, I'll go back to <laughs> the FedEx analogy. There's no destination point <laughs> for, for making this better. It's just got to continue, and I agree with what Mike said. Um, really, an oversight uh, role, a very active oversight role has to be played by Congress and the relevant uh, committees constantly, and uh, um, there's an opportunity for the new uh, president, whoever it is, to do the same, uh, to do a top to bottom. It is 15 years, and I, I have no question that uh, these agencies, DHS, uh, DNI, and CTC, have made us safer. Um, could they use a review? Of course they could, and it ought to happen soon. Congressman, a quick last word on that point. Uh, yes and no. Yes, we fusion centers helped. I think you needed to shrink them down. I, I don't think we needed as many across the country. Some of them became a status symbol to have one, not necessarily related to the work of which they're about to do. So major cities, you know, you can imagine Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, Detroit, places that were hotbeds of activity made a lot of sense to have a fusion center. I think it was good. We put them in other places that, that had to, I mean, if you looked at their metrics on success, boy, they got really creative. There were some great creative writers hired <laughs> in some of these fusion centers. And, and, and they were taking other people's work and reprinting it in their documents. We just don't have the funds to tolerate, I think, that kind of a loose operation anymore. So I would have them, but I would really target them around the country. And then, and then you'd have more money to spend on collecting local officers to participate. Some of them were having a hard time make, filling their obligation, and they add so much value in those fusion centers. But again, it's, it's what it's, yes is, is, and I think in all of these, yeah, great idea. Implementation, we have some work. Spoken like a, a true former FBI agent. <laughs> Congressman, <laughs> And Senator, they should be in charge of all of it. I was Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.